It's really a great pleasure to be here, and thank you, uh, uh, Bill, for that uh, introduction. Let me first make a few acknowledgments. Um, I would, of course, like to acknowledge the National Groundwater Association for their sponsorship of this lecture. Uh, it's really been a once-in-a-life opportunity for me. Um, and uh, I would encourage any of you, especially students that are thinking about joining a professional organization, to think about uh, joining the National Groundwater Association. It's not only a great bargain, but it's, uh, it's just a great organization. Uh, you get a couple of journals and that with your, with your membership, and so I would encourage you to think about that. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge my colleagues back at the University of Utah who are picking up some of my teaching load as I wander around the world giving this lecture. Uh, mostly, I'd like to acknowledge just a number of really outstanding students that I've been fortunate enough to work with since uh, I've been at the University of Utah. And I'm going to highlight some of their work specifically as we go along in the talk, and, and I'll uh, do that uh, at a later point. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my association with the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, I've had a long-standing uh, association uh, with researchers at both uh, the Salt Lake uh, District Office as well as at their national research uh, centers uh, in Reston, Virginia, uh, Menlo Park and in uh, Denver, Colorado, and that, and that uh, has really benefited me greatly. Well, uh, as Bill indicated, uh, this lecture is named after Henry Darcy, and many of you know that uh, Henry Philippe Gaspart Darcy was born in 1803 in Dijon, France. And like virtually all of us in this room, Henry Darcy was privileged. Privileged in the sense that he was afforded at least what I consider to be the amazing opportunity of a college education. He did that at the Polytechnic in Paris, and as a young scientist and engineer, his first assignment was to return back to his hometown and provide them with, quote, a safe and reliable water supply. And for those of us that think of Henry Darcy as being the foundation of quantitative hydrogeology, there's some irony in this story in that his first attempt at doing that was a deep production well, and that failed quite miserably. He had to go on to uh, divert a nearby spring to form the famous fountains of Dijon, the pride of France at that time. Um, but it's really the failure of that deep production well that I want to focus on a little bit today. Because here we are nearly 200 years after his birth, and I think we're still faced with many of the same issues that existed in Henry Darcy's time. That deep production well did not fail because they f did not encounter this, the water table. Of course, you'll do that almost anywhere on Earth where you drill if you do it deep enough. It failed simply because they didn't understand the subsurface in a way that was sufficient to make a prediction about the water yielding capacity of the subsurface. Now, I also think there's some irony that I would be asked to deliver the Darcy Lecture because I've spent the last 15 years or so trying to understand the subsurface and subsurface flow systems without using Darcy's law. Or maybe more accurately, I should say, I've been trying to do this in a way that's complementary to Darcy's law, using environmental tracers. Broadly, we can think about these as being substances that occur either naturally or due to anthropogenic activities in precipitation. We don't have to put them there. And to the extent that these tracers have time embedded into them, for example, if if a fluid enters the subsurface here and it has something that's radioactive dissolved into it, as it moves through the subsurface, if we collect a sample at this point in space, my contention is that that single sample contains information about the entire upstream flow path. It might be complicated. It might be very difficult to deconvolve that information. But the hypothesis here is that that point sample contains more information than if you just looked at a point sample of the uh, physical properties of the porous uh, media. So that sort of leads to an idea of, uh, if I can get this to work, that sort of leads to an idea of geochemical tomography. That is, that we collect a sample at a point in space and try to say something a far field. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that I know how to image the subsurface in a way that might be implied by this really nice detailed tomogram. I don't know how to do that. I don't know that I will ever know how to do that. 
But what I do want to do is show you some of the progress that I think we've made in the last 15 years or so uh, and why I think there is at least some promise in moving towards this concept of using these tracers to image the subsurface in a way that allows us to make predictions. So what I want to do is give you an introduction to just one class of environmental tracers, dissolved inert gases. Some of these gases are produced within the subsurface, so we'll talk about that a bit. Some of these gases are present in groundwater simply because groundwater was once in contact with the atmosphere and gases that dissolve into groundwater do so under the influence of temperature. The solubility is temperature dependent and so these might be useful as a, a thermometer. We'll talk about that a bit. And I'm going to end uh, with a site where we've tried to make use of a number of these tracers to solve a regional groundwater flow problem. Well, let's first talk about Earth's uh, atmosphere. It exists, of course, almost entirely of just two gases, and neither of those can be considered to be inert. Not even nitrogen in the subsurface, because processes such as denitrification often, especially these days, lead to a production of N2 gas in the subsurface. But fortunately, there are a number of other gases, the, namely the noble gases, and although their abundance in the atmosphere is small, lots of zeros here, meaning that we're going to have to make very careful and precise measurements to use these, the fact that they are noble gases means that we can sort of eliminate chemistry. Indeed, that's the very reason that I'm using these. So I hope I don't disappoint you, but this talk is really a lot more about the physics of groundwater flow than about the chemistry of groundwater flow. That's why I'm interested in, in the noble gases. Now one of these, helium, is produced in large abundance in the subsurface and it's also present in the atmosphere, but we're going to use this in quite a bit different way than the rest of these gases that are primarily in groundwater because uh, groundwater was once in contact with the atmosphere. We can think about the dissolved concentration as being the sum of a number of different components. First of all, there is an atmospheric solubility component. It's, of course, a function of temperature, pressure, or the elevation of the site, and salinity. It's not a very strong function of salinity if we're near freshwater conditions. This becomes quite important at seawater salinities and very important uh, when we get to, to brines. Um, it turns out that almost whenever we look at the dissolved gas composition of groundwater, there is more gas than you can explain from thermodynamics. And because that gas typically has a composition that looks an awful lot like the atmosphere, it's come to be known as excess air. I'm going to talk about this in more detail later, but for the moment I want you to think about this as probably arising as a result of a water table that rises up and traps gas bubbles. And those bubbles are no longer at the barometric pressure, they're being acted upon by fluid pressure and they either partially or completely dissolve, thereby imparting more gas to the water. What's important here is that the magnitude of this term probably depends on how much the water table goes up and down. And we used to sort of think of this as an annoyance, and I think we're now recognizing that it might be useful as an indicator of that very parameter. And then finally, uh, oh, I should mention that this uh, the process of, of adding air is especially important for the light noble gases. And that's because there's a definite relationship between solubility and molecular weight. The light noble gases are not nearly as soluble as the heavy noble gases. And what that effectively means is if you take some air and due to pressure you just force it into groundwater, you're going to affect the concentration of the low solubility gases a lot more than you would the high solubility gases. So this is an issue for all of these, but it's especially an issue for helium and neon. And then finally, there can be an internal production uh, of gases, and that's mostly an issue for helium-4. So what I'm going to do in this talk is kind of start with an example of internal production, and then we'll, mo we'll move backward through this list and end up talking about some thermodynamic solubility of gases.